and um, then we'll dive right in. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Boston City Council's chaos in my house and um, hearing on docket number 0424, order for hearing discussing the status of late night tea service in Greater Boston. My name is Michelle Wu and I'm chair of the Committee on Planning, Development and Transportation. And we are here with several colleagues, including the lead sponsor, Councilor Julia Mejia, uh, also joined by Councilor Ed Flynn, and Councillor Liz, oh, Councillor Liz Braden and Councillor Kenzie Bach. Um, I want to remind everyone that this is a public hearing being recorded and broadcast on Comcast 8, RCN 82, and Verizon 1964 at a later date, also currently being streamed at the City of Boston's website. We will take public testimony throughout the hearing. If you're interested in testifying, please email ron.cobb, C-O-B-B, at boston.gov for the link and then follow along on the live stream to know when it's your turn to speak. Um, and for those who will be speaking during public testimony, please state your name and affiliation, residence, and limit your comments to two minutes to ensure that everybody's comments and concerns can be heard. Okay, um, so again, thank you so much for joining us. We'll do some very quick opening remarks um, from our colleagues on the council, then dive into one large panel with advocates and the city, city of Boston's administration and then Q&A. Councilor Mejia, would you kick us off? Yes. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Councilor Wu, um, for your partnership in co-sponsoring this hearing order alongside our office. We really do appreciate your long-term advocacy in all things transit, um, your work in this space. Um, is, is definitely one of the things that a lot of people point to when we think about transit justice. And so really do appreciate your partnership. Um, I, as, um, I'd like to just quickly just say that we expect this hearing to go pretty quickly, but that doesn't mean that this uh, topic is, isn't important. Um, the issue is personal and professional to me. And if I didn't have my beat up Chevy Nova back in the day, I would probably be completely stranded on my way home from my late night work. Um, and so late night tea service is crucial as a means to bring late night employees home safely. It's also crucial to support small businesses and provide a safe mean transportation for women, LGBTQ plus individuals and anyone who finds themselves um, in, in a neighborhood that they do not know um, late night. Um, and uh, on a side note, as many of the employees who will benefit from the late night tea service are also probably still asleep. So moving forward, we would need to find ways to bring this conversation to them. But I see this as a brief reintroduction to this topic and to those who have not been consistently tied into this work. I look forward to this conversation and learning more. And I would also like to thank Jared Johnson from Transit Matters for working with us on this issue. And we look forward to working with all of our advocates beyond this conversation. And just really quick, um, I know that Jared had reached out to our office um, back in March, but with COVID and the transition and everybody being home, um, remote uh, working, we his email got lost, um, but we wanted to just publicly acknowledge that when we talk about all means all, and those who are living the reality should be leading the work. Um, a lot of the work that Jared Johnson does in this space, um, it's important for him to know that we we see him and we value him and unfortunately he's not able to join us but I know he's going to be holding us accountable to the work and we look forward to his his, his partnership in that. Thank you. Thank you Councilor Mejia. Councilor Flynn. Oh Councilor Ed Flynn. Oh thank thank you Councilor Wu. Um, thank you to the sponsors. Um, thank you to Council Mejia. Uh, it's an important subject that we're discussing today. Um, a safe, reliable MBTA system is critical to the economy of our state, but also important to low income residents, workers, our immigrants um, that rely on the MBTA to get to various places of employment including restaurants that close at midnight or, or one o'clock. 
Um, I have a lot of constituents in my district that work in the restaurant uh, field or, or at bars and they need the they need public transportation to get home. Um, also a safe and reliable, effective MBTA will keep more cars hopefully off, off the street where people will be using the MBTA. It also hopefully will improve uh, pedestrian safety, safety as well. So I just wanna say thank you to my colleagues for uh, this important discussion and to the city administration and advocates for being here. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. I wanna recognize that Councillor Asabi George and Councillor Edwards have joined us as well. And next for a quick opening statement is Councillor Liz Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. And also thank you to Councillor Mejia for uh, sponsoring this hearing order. Um, I think uh, it was filed way back in February and it certainly was an issue of great concern then. Uh, it's probably an issue of even greater concern now in light of the MBTA plans to curtail their late evening services and weekend services so and cut back on some routes entirely. So I look forward to the conversation uh, and I also want to flag up that the, the, that, uh, the importance of the MBTA to our essential workers to, uh, to get to and for, from their jobs at all hours, the day and night. And um, it's really important that we have a, a robust and reliable public transit system for all of our residents in Boston. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Councillor Bach. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I second Councillor Braden's comments. I think that uh, you know I I was uh, at the hearings trying to stop the MBTA from pulling back on late night, and I think that was like January, February, twenty sixteen. Um, and it is beyond discouraging um, to be having a hearing that you know we thought was going to be about revisiting that question of how to how to push later, how to do it for the sake of our. Um, our restaurants, our restaurant workers, um, all of our last shift workers, uh, many of whom I know, um, you know, live in Councillor Edwards' district and for whom the T uh, is, a, is a far preferable option to paying for a cab. Um, and I think like that's the conversation we should be having today. Instead, we're staring down these proposed cuts from two days ago that would pull back service by another hour. Um, and I just, it, it underscores to me, I think the T has uh, periodically talked about this late night time as a sort of shoulder service where the number of riders doesn't justify um, the service, but it's not like we just cut off the T, you know, at 11 to one on a Sunday because not that many people are out of bed. Like part, like part of uh, public good is that you're providing it reliably for when folks need it um, as opposed to tailoring it so specifically to use that you cause a vicious cycle where you lose that use. So um, I, as folks know, I'm super concerned about these cuts and particularly the way that they, I mean, I'm concerned about them across the board. The way they hit my district is really unacceptable um, on the E-line closing it from Brigham to Heath Street. And we had a rally about that yesterday and um, are gonna continue to be pushing on that. Um, but that's obviously in the context of a larger landscape of unacceptable service cuts that are gonna send more cars into our neighborhoods, are gonna drive up asthma rates where they're already high um, and, and are just going to, in a short-sighted way, really curtail an economic recovery when we get there um, because we have so many businesses that employ so many people um, that rely on uh, being able to have a, a later night service. So I'm glad we're talking about this. I'm discouraged by the moment that we're talking about this in, um, but I think we just have to fight like hell against the cuts that have been uh, proposed on Monday, so. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Councillor Sabi George. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry to be coming to you from behind my picture as soon as I'm settled and not in transit. I will um, come in person, but just want to echo the opening statements of colleagues and uh, thanks to the lead sponsor on this issue and the unfortunate continued conversation and, and so much work, not just left undone, but what we've seen, especially over the last couple of days and sort of a significant digression um, in services and in those cuts. So look forward to today's hearing and um, you know, continuing the work that is underway. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Sabi George. Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much. Um, and again, I echo um, the thanks to Councillor uh, Mejia for the wonderful um, opportunity to have this conversation and to have it in a way that 
I think really further emphasizes that our economy depends on people being able to come home from work. Our economy depends on a reliable public transportation. And we really cannot talk quite seriously about restaurant revitalization if restaurant workers can't come home. This is, this is the dichotomy of this moment is that we are literally trying to save restaurants. One in five restaurants are gonna close. Many of them are downtown Boston and many of them have as workers who need to get home on public transportation. Our economy would actually, I think, improve if we had more increased public transportation right now. So people can move and get to and from work. So that's one, it's the economic argument. The other one is, I don't know how we are going to claim in any way, shape or form we are becoming, or we're headed towards being a world-class city. If our transportation system isn't even matching some of the basic levels of other world cities as well. This is, it's not making any sense. And then finally, if we're gonna talk about being ready or climate ready this or climate ready that, or trying to be our best in terms of setting up a future for our future, for our children, then if you do not emphasize and push for public transportation and instead have people rely on either their cars or losing income, then you're not really committed to a true, truly green economy. So it's economically, economically it makes sense. In terms of our green living, it makes sense. And honestly, and I forgot also in terms of equity, let's be very clear about who's on public transportation and who can get in a car and drive home. So with all of these reasons, I firmly believe that we lean in to preventing people from further going into poverty. We lean in towards revitalizing our restaurants. We lean in towards a greener economy. And by doing all of that requires us to lean in to a robust public transportation system, including late night tea service. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Edwards. Um, okay, thank you so much to all of our colleagues. We'll dive into the panel right now. And the order will be Anna, then Stacy, then Vinit, and Matt. Great. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to go first and um, for this um, for this invitation. I'm really pleased to be here, and I really appreciate the the sponsors, the co-sponsors, and all the counselors for being here um, to talk about something that is essential. Uh, my name is Anna Leslie, and I direct the Alston Brighton Health Collaborative. And though that is in Elston Brighton, I think what I speak to is citywide. Um, and we have been in existence for six years and we have focused on transportation for four of those years because it is an essential determinant of public health. Um, and we've worked closely with the city and the state in that time to get some real public health improvements on the ground in public transit. Um, so I wanna, I guess I, I will focus my comments on health and on public health, and I know many of the counselors have already spoken to this this morning, there are literal safety issues with keeping public transit open and accessible and making sure that people get home safely and are not reliant on potentially unsafe spaces and systems. And we have tragically seen examples of that in our city in recent years. So keeping systems as open and accessible for all people um, is essential to, to literal health, um, both, both mental and physical. Um, but I also want to talk about economic health, and, and counselors have touched on that as well. Um, Alston Brighton, as Councillor Braden knows, um, is, is rich with uh, late night activity, with restaurants, um, with artists, with people who rely on these services. It's also rich with development and with new financing coming into a neighborhood that is coming there for that reason, because of the richness already there. Uh, and honestly is looking to benefit and profit off of the systems and the richness already there instead of contributing to those systems. Uh, and so the fact that we have a system right now that is economically strapped and strained and our Boston Transportation Department is doing everything they can to keep pace with all of the requests and all of the changes. And we have a development system that is loading more people into our neighborhoods um, and loading uh, uh, increasing stress and strain on a neighborhood and on several neighborhoods that have a richness of, of culture and of small business and of things that rely on systems that they are taking advantage of. They need to pay into these systems. This is an economic opportunity 
where we as a, as a city and as advocates need to go back very strongly to any development proposed and say, you need to contribute to our already functioning public transit system. Do not create your own private system. We have a shuttle service. It's the MBTA. Put money into that system. Uh, in the same way, our large institutions, our colleges, our universities, our hospitals, their folks are relying on late night service, uh, be they their students, be they their staff. And they are also, yes, strapped and strained in, uh, in a global pandemic, but they also have immense reserves that people like myself do not. And they need to pull on those reserves. The, the rainy day has arrived. You need to open up your rainy day funds and contribute to our public transit system. Um, so that is all an issue of public health. Uh, I think the term public health has come into the modern vernacular more than it ever has this year, but it's not just about epidemiology, uh, a course I took 10 years ago and I've forgotten everything about. Um, it, is, it is about community health. It is about preventative wellness. Um, it's about the, the curb cut effect, which is the analogy that I love the most um, in, in the 70s when advocates moving around our city spaces could not actually exit a sidewalk and cross because there was no cut in the curb for, for somebody in a wheelchair or somebody with a stroller. And so they cut the curb themselves. And, and that is the reason that we have cuts and curbs because people made that change. And that has allowed for everybody to access systems, not just people that need that curb cut. Um, so we need to think about the people that need that equity because that lifts all shifts. Um, and that, that is the core of public health. And so when we think about late night service, we're thinking about the people that need that service at the baseline, that lifts all ships, um, that, that supports all of us. And maybe I am not using late night service, but I benefit because somebody else does use it. Um, so my message here is yes, whatever we can do to support late night service, please let us know. And that might look like something we wouldn't have expected, which is demanding that those that are profiting off of our systems contribute to those systems. That's what I have. I'm happy to answer questions, but I, I don't think you have any for me. So thank you so much for letting me be here. Thank you, Anna. Stacey? Uh, thanks. And thank you um, to Councilor Mejia for calling this hearing. Uh, I know that uh, the intention was to have this a while ago, but the timing seems perfect uh, in an unfortunate way. And thanks, um, obviously, to the council for holding this and for all of you for being here. Um, you know, I, I think it's an advantage that, uh, you know, as, as I look around this space, the administration, the advocates, and the council are all on the same page. Um, you know, as an advocate, I'm not showing up in this space to try to convince anyone here that we need late night service. And so um, I am interested in, in bringing the information that I know that I think is powerful to this group and then focusing on actions we can take. Um, and so happy to dig into any of the wonk, but that's sort of the intention of my, uh, my testimony today. Um, of course, never a dull moment. I always want to just get stuff done. So first, I do just want to um, thank you, Councillor Bach, for bringing up 2016. You know, we've been on this roller coaster around late night service for a decade. Some of us have seen this go up and down. It's a Pilot and then we stop, and it's a pilot and then we stop. And there's always this narrative of there just quite aren't quite enough people, and we can only do it for six months or 18 months. Um, and as you mentioned, Councillor Mejia, Transit Matters and the City of Boston spent like an enormous amount of time and energy working on the 2018 pilots um, that were successful. Just, you know, I was pulling up some of the data. I, I feel like I'm stealing your thunder, Vanit and Matt. Um, but, you know, what we learned from those pilots is that some of the busiest bus routes start service before 5 a.m. That early morning service is actually where we saw the biggest bump because folks need to get to their jobs. And that service was needed seven days a week. Um, even though, you know, you know, service bumps around on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, and that when we looked at that sort of 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, window that folks did use that increased service in communities like Dorchester, Roxbury, 
Charlestown, Everett, East Boston, Lynn, um, more bus trips um, in those neighborhoods were, were used, right? And so we don't need more information. We don't need another pilot. We don't need to convince anyone. We already know from the work that we've done that people use this service and people need this service. Um, but what we also know is that there's an over-reliance on fares. You know, the city of Boston already pays in <laughs> to the system quite a bit. We've had hearings on that. Um, and that every time we talk about this, it's like, well, we can't jam the bus like sardines like we do at five o'clock in the afternoon. So it's not worth it. And that's just not a good way to plan a transit system. Um, so, you know, I think we, we, we need to be using, I literally took these statistics off of the MBTA's website where they talk about how successful these pilots were. So I think we need to start using that information saying like, look, we referenced your data. So why are you cutting this service when you've already made the case to your Self and the public that this service is necessary and good, and that when you when you build it, they do come. And then I think you know from the the council's perspective and areas where we would love to partner with you all and the administration. Um, you know, part this is really rooted in a chronic underinvestment in the MBTA, and even if we get federal stimulus to help fill the MBTA gap, that does not solve the late service problem and it does not solve these sort of chronic issues. It just sort of is a stop gap and we'll be having the same hearing and the same conversation late in 2021 again. So I think, um, you know, many of you have gotten on the transit is essential bandwagon. All of you, um, you know, said that you wanna delay these cuts, but I, I think we need to really work um, collectively with the Boston delegation in the state house to make sure that we are putting together balanced progressive revenue packages that actually meaningfully fund the MBTA. There are a lot of advocates working on that. And, you know, I know you all talk to our state electeds. We do too. Maybe we could be a little more coordinated or think together about how we have a consistent message and really push that through. Cause that's, that's the sort of golden ticket is getting sustained long-term funding that is not so dependent on fares. Um, I think the second piece is, is pushing back on the new fare collection system. You know, again, the T is, the T is spending a billion dollars, nearly a billion dollars on this new fare collection system because they're banking on, again, funding the system through fares. And so asking some hard questions about, um, about that program. Anna's also heavily involved in that. We're happy to have, there've been a few hearings on this, but what works and what doesn't, and why are we why are we so excited about nickeling and diming bus riders when their fares have gone up 300% and the gas tax has gone up 17% in the last 30 years? Like that's a good question to ask. And I think the third piece, um, and I know the city's doing this, is we need to continue to invest in bus infrastructure, whether the T is gonna run that service or not. So the work that we're doing to put bus lanes down, the work that we're doing to improve bus stops, like we, that is what we control and that's what we need to do because we are going to fight like hell to get that service back and I want to make sure that we have the bus lanes ready for when we're running buses on them. So that's my thoughts on actions we can take. Happy to chat more um, with any of you offline or in this conversation. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Stacey. Manit and Matt. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, councillors, for uh, hosting this uh, council hearing. Uh, it's very timely, and uh, as you know, the administration is, uh, is supportive of what uh, what uh, the different councillors and what Stacy and Anna have mentioned. And uh, thank you, uh, Stacy, for uh, talking about uh, the success of uh, Nate Light Service. I was just looking at some previous letters, and I saw that in December of 2018, the administration came out strongly, uh, suggesting that the uh, pilot for late night service be made permanent. And uh, we, we've quoted statistics about how successful the service has been. So thank you for getting that to the table, Stacey. But it's really important, and some people mentioned this, to see this late night service in the context of the 125, the 125 million proposed service cuts uh, that were presented at the FMCB board hearing uh, as recently as uh, last Monday. And these proposed service cuts are precisely when we're expecting our economy to rebound. And the current plans will drop service and add congestion to our streets uh, precisely when we don't want that to happen. And I think that the, the two words that have been used are uh, essential services and the success of particularly late night service. And I think that we, we should build on those two kind of uh, trends. Uh, these cuts 
will have an overwhelming impact on transit riders in the Boston area. During this pandemic, our priorities are to protect public health, to ensure equitable treatment for our lower income residents, and to keep our city running so we can recover. The proposed cuts will reduce the frequency of subway and bus service in the neighborhoods that rely most on public transit and are also home to the highest populations of people of color and of low income and of immigrants. Under the proposal, service will end earlier, impacting late night shift workers. As you know, a large number of essential workers continue to rely on transit during the pandemic. So we are, uh, the administration is completely uh, in support of uh, opposing this late night service cut. The city is doing its part, as Stacy mentioned. We are very engaged and are expending uh, city resources for bus lanes, improving bus stops, uh, working with the MBTA on a daily basis to see how we can get them to uh, keep service to our residents uh, intact and improving. And for sure, uh, you know, all the city councillors have been supportive with the, to the administration's efforts and uh, particular thanks to Stacy and Anna for the advocacy they've been doing. I'm going to hand it over to Matt, who can get into the specifics of uh, some of the things that we're looking at relative to late night service, unless you have some quick questions for me, but, or you can ask your questions uh, after we finish. Thanks. It's, yeah, I think great to have Matt go and then we can ask of any of the panelists. Thank you, Vinny. Uh, great, thank you very much for that introduction. And um, good morning, Madam Speaker, members of the council. Uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, of course, to the advocates uh, for their time and everyone who, who is uh, listening today. Uh, so my name is Matt Moran. I work for the Boston Transportation Department and I lead the uh, transit team here at BTD. As many of you know, late night services is invaluable for essential workers and provides critical mobility for Boston residents. Over 60,000 workers start or end work between 12 a.m. and 5 a.m. in Greater Boston, according to an analysis by the BPDA. These workers are concentrated in the fields of transportation, food preparation and serving, often administrative support, construction, management, and healthcare practitioners and technicians. Further, according to this analysis, most employees who arrive late night at work are using a cab, about 46%, or a ride-sharing service, uh, or drive alone, that's about 39%. Within late night service, we have three overarching goals um, sort of since we began the pilot a few years ago and moving forward. So our first goal is to increase equity. Uh, this is especially true for the 30% or more of residents in East Boston, Dorchester, Mission Hill, Longwood, and Roxbury who do not have access to vehicles and have household incomes less than 52,000 a year. The absence of late night bus service limits economic opportunities or requires workers to use more costly means of commuting. Our second goal is to expand opportunity. By providing service uh, from between key origins and destinations, we will be able to broaden the recruiting pool for employers and improve access to job opportunities for the region's residents. Our third main goal is to reduce emissions. With a high percentage of our current overnight trips conducted by car, Switching travelers to buses would aid the region and Commonwealth in hitting our climate reduction targets that are essential for both public health and resiliency goals. Um, this has been mentioned before, so not to belabor it, but uh, a little bit of background about uh, our late night bus efforts. So the city of Boston, in partnership with the cities of Cambridge and Somerville, Transit Matters and Livable Streets, among others, proposed an overnight bus service pilot program to the MBTA in 2017. The MBTA accepted this pilot program and an early morning pilot was launched in April of 2018. And an overnight pilot was launched in September of 2018. These pilots had essentially three components. The first component, as mentioned, was in earlier starts to existing trips. The second component were later ends to existing bus services and routes. And the third was a new overnight bus system, um, roughly between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. to cover the gap between when services ended, traditional services ended and traditional services began. In April of 2019, the MBTA made permanent certain elements of this pilot. Notably, the early morning pilot um, and the 10 p.m. to midnight services were maintained. Additionally, the MBTA added a few more trips after 12.30 p.m. to certain bus routes. Unfortunately, the MBTA decided to curtail the overnight bus routes, meaning that there's essentially no MBTA service between 1.30 uh, to um, 5 a.m. 
So moving forward, we understand that late night bus service um, might not have drawn the initial ridership as hoped, but we know that there's demand there just based on the numbers of employees who are commuting in the Boston area um, during those late night hours. Uh, we are pleased that the T decided to expand that, um, the, or to, uh, extend the pilot that was, um, that was in place with the sort of later evening and sort of earlier morning trips. Um, but we know that these services are under threat um, right now. And we are hoping to get to continue working as we hopefully come out of the pandemic uh, to improve and increase overnight bus services with um, the T and with the council and with advocates here um, for the benefit of our residents to improve mobility options and improve equity. So thanks for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much to everyone. Um, okay, I'm going to double check to see no one else has joined for public testimony. So I think that's great for now. And we'll go to questions from counselors, starting with Councilor Mejia. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thank you again to all for your um, testimonies. I'm curious. Um, I'm going to start with Anna. Just uh, when you talk about holding developers accountable by paying into public transit, do you see that as a policy action item or something where we're, we're just not just showing up in spaces and yelling at developers? <laughs> It's definitely both, um, but I do think it there's a there's more opportunity for partnership with Boston Planning and Development Agency, um, and also um, Boston Transportation Department has been doing a lot of work around this with um, some of the advanced um, transportation demand management and TAPAs um, acronyms, which I either know the acronym and or don't know. I know the. Anyway, those are their plans, um, but they kind of outline for developers a sort of a suite of services, be they either mitigations or um, community benefits that they need to contribute when, when they build. Um, and it, the, the challenging thing at a regional level, at a, at a neighborhood level, is that that's all done, for the most part, that's done project by project. So you could have a 10 story development happening and they're committing to improving the streetscape just in front of their development. Um, and it doesn't extend across the system. So there, there are definitely opportunities, I think, for, for you all as a council um, to, to look at how we, um, we require that proponents and developers look at it from a system perspective. And that could be a geographic system, um, so, a, so a corridor, and we're doing a lot of work with that in Olson Brighton right now with the Western Ave corridor and rezoning project. Um, but I think it's also an opportunity to look at it from a line. I've been talking with the T um, and, and with BTD about those opportunities and possibilities, um, but, but perhaps it's looking at uh, the 86 or, or the 57 routes that I know better. Um, and if, if the 86 is delayed in Sullivan Square, that matters to somebody waiting for it on Western Ave. Um, and so it doesn't really matter to improve the Western Ave section of the line if the problem is in Sullivan. Um, so how, so that obviously moves us beyond a municipal contribution and into a system contribution. So how can that money go to the T um, and, and think about it from a, from a system perspective? Um, so, so those, I think those are a couple options. There's definitely a lot of on the ground advocacy happening with sort of advocates and um, residents who are part of the, the impact advisory groups starting to beat the same drum on expectations around transportation mitigations, but also really defining what's a mitigation? What's like an expectation if you're coming here, you need to do this and what's a benefit? What's an addition? And I find that often developers um, are seeing this more as, as benefits, that they are contributing to a, a lacking system. These, these are mitigations. You're, you, are, you are benefiting from coming to us. Um, what are you going to do to mitigate your impact? Um, I, I would also lastly, um, really maybe push for more detail specifically on the transportation analyses that come from these projects and corridor studies writ large. I very consistently see those analyses coming back saying that it 
is either. It could be a 10 story building or a 22 story building. And the analysis always says there will be no increased impact on the system, which is categorically impossible. So I, I, you know, I think that's another opportunity, um, both within the council and within the city of Austin, uh, you know, as an institution to, to ask for more clarity there. Um, so yes, a lot, a lot of, 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 um, policy opportunities. Yeah. And I know that you have a hard stop, but I just want to ask one more question. Um, you know, I, I understand that it's the planning and development, but I also think that there is an opportunity and maybe if you have any information, if there's been any traction in this particular area is like employers, you know, there are a lot of people who are working in the city of Boston who have um, commercial real estate and uh, there needs to be, when I think about accountability, it has to be 360. Everybody has to feel a sense of responsibility for transit. And oftentimes it just falls in different pockets and I'm new in the conversation, but I'm just curious, what if any traction are we looking at in terms of employer accountability, if any? Agreed. And, and I think we see the accountability at the, at the larger levels. Um, so again, Alston Brighton perspective, like New Balance, huge employer in the neighborhood. And so they're certainly put more in the spotlight on what their contribution is, but you're absolutely right. There, there are myriad types of, of businesses um, contributing to and benefiting from the system. So the T does have some mechanisms um, of encouragement, be they um, MBTA passes that are, that are grouped um, so that there's a discount for the employers as a whole. But I think to Stacey's point, that's a focus on the fares and that's a focus on the individual instead of the business proactively contributing to improving the system. Um, which I see a lot less of. Um, so, so yes, I think there, there are real opportunities there. I definitely defer more, I think, to, to Stacy and, and Vinny and Matt on those. Um, but, and I, I lost my other train of thought there, um, but I think that that's absolutely um, a good point and an opportunity. Um, and, and I think lastly, to Stacy's point that there's, I think all of us here really are on the same page with this. So if there is more one band, one sound, that yeah. we can we can muster, um, and because on the ground people are beyond frustrated and beyond over it. So how how do we carry that voice forward in uh, and you know, Councilor Mejia, you know this better than any of us in like in an in an organized uh, and mobilized way. Thank you. And I just realized that I only have like five to seven minutes and I've used most of my time, but I will ask one question to Stacy. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about funding systems through fares? Um, I think a lot of people think that the T is funded through fares, but it isn't, that isn't really the case. Can you just point to other cities and states that aren't so focused on nickel and diming the passengers? Yeah, yeah. So I will answer that question. And I do just want to um, bump a couple of things, Anna. I was taking notes and was like, ooh, ooh I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take two, two minutes of my time. Um, two other things that I just want to flag. Um, we have increasingly found um, uh, around sort of like developments and community benefits, just from like a base community level, um, a lot of folks don't know what they can ask developers for. And so like we, we had a conversation with a community member recently where a developer was like, here, we'll give you a community garden. And she was talking to her neighbors and they were so excited about that. And she's like, but we should be asking for an improvement to the, the tea stop and this. And they were like, oh, we didn't even know that that is a thing we could ask for. So I think that there's also like a real opportunity to just like help the public understand and that we we can and should be asking for more things and it's more than a community garden right that 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 we can do more so i just want to put a pin in that because i know a lot of folks in this group care about that community engagement and then on the employer stuff um we've also found through customer intercept surveys matt and vinit know this that a lot of employers think that they're they're the people who come to their business and their employees drive and that when you do employee and customer intercept surveys they, they and give those employers back that information they're usually surprised by how many 
many people um, are actually using transit. So I think in order you know, to help get employers on board, we also need to be doing some of that legwork. We're certainly doing it, but I think we could do more. Um, but there are also like major employers in the seaport um, that invest in private shuttle services. Um, and you know, I will never get off of my Northern Avenue bridge bandwagon where I'm like, why are we spending $100 million on a bridge to carry private shuttles when we could spend half that amount of money and like also be talking about how we could be investing some of those funds into the MBTA. Um, and so like that is a separate hearing probably, but I wanted to flag that because I think it gets to what you were you were surfacing. Um, and then specifically on fares. So great, great, great question. Um, right now, the MBTA expects about $750 million of its, of its revenue to come from people paying into the system. Um, uh, communities like Kansas City <laughs> are looking at making their, their transit free. Um, LA is looking at this. Um, Worcester is also looking at this. And part of the reason why they're interested in fare free transit is that it is so expensive to collect fares. <laughs> so, and this is very true specifically for buses. So in Worcester, they did an analysis and found that they were spending almost the amount of money that they were collecting fares in, in like, in act, the actual process of collecting fares, right? So they'd get $3 million and then they were spending $2.8 million to actually just collect that money. Um, and so, you know, we've also done this analysis for the MBTA. It's part of the reason why so many small to mid-sized towns are really looking at this seriously because it's very expensive to collect small amounts of money from people through a transit system, you know? And so I, I when, so that is just like at the root of why you hear things like free transit, free buses, but separately, you know, increasingly other communities are looking at treating transit like healthcare, like education, where you use sort of sustained tax mechanisms to pay for those services and treat them like, yes, some people might never use that service, but everyone benefits from it. Some people might only use it sometimes. Some people might be more expensive in the system because they use late night. It's the same as having a, a person who has pre-existing conditions. We all pay into the healthcare system to support that individual because it's better for all of us. So we're seeing that in other communities as well. And we're happy to send you more details on that. Thank you, Stacey. And I wanna be super mindful of the time constraints. Um, so I will ask. Do you have any, do you have any questions for um, the administration yes, folks? I'm, yeah, I'm just curious how, how um, the administration is working alongside low income communities and communities of color to advocate for better public transit. And I'm just curious how they're utilizing their voice um, on the city level to really push um, like for an agreement between the council and the administration to do something more? Like what role are you all playing to be more inclusive and collaborative with the council and the state around this issue? Yeah, uh, thank you, Council Mejia. I'm uh, happy to address that. And I'm happy to also, if you give me some time to add to some of the issues that uh, Anna and Stacy brought up. So uh, as you all know, uh, the mayor, uh, understanding the importance of public transportation for our residents uh, established the city's first transit team and which uh, Matt Moran, who's on this call, heads up it. And uh, his, uh, his team is uh, working day in and day out with uh, neighborhoods throughout the city, uh, whether it's doing extensive community meetings and in-person outreach socially distanced, of course, along Blue Hill Avenue to get better public transportation on Blue Hill Avenue. That public process has been going on for a year, uh, whether it's working with the residents of Roxbury uh, to look at Warren Street and the Nubian Square area, uh, whether it's working with uh, and Council of Flynn most as well, uh, with the residents of South Boston. Uh, we are, and Anna knows that uh, Matt has been very, very engaged with, uh, with Austin Brighton including uh, the installation of bus lanes. Uh, we are very active in Jamaica Plain. Uh, there's a bus lane in Constituency on the, on the border there, uh, but uh, between Jamaica Plain and Roxbury, but uh, we are, there's a uh, bus lane in construction right at uh, Columbus Avenue, connecting Eggleston and Jackson Squares. We are very active throughout the neighborhoods. We've also engaged programs such as making T-passes available in all our public libraries, 
to allow residents to understand that they can make substantial savings if they use a pass rather than buy one-off tickets. Uh, and we are doing educational outreach uh, throughout the city. So uh, I, I'm saying all of this merely as an ambassador, Matt Moran and his team do all the work. Uh, but I just wanted to add that we are in fact, this is to Anna's points, uh, working with, uh, with developers where we are formalizing programs of how they contribute to public transportation, how they will be required to have the, their tenants and future kind of uh, people who occupy their buildings, employers, uh, they'll be required to offer uh, TPAS subsidies. So that's a very formal process that's been actually going on for some time and to some success. We've also started to work uh, at a kind of corridor wide or line wise, you know, whether it's a bus route or an important transit corridor, where we are in fact kind of combining what contributions developers make to do analyses of these corridors to improve public service, uh, to improve public transportation, include, uh, improve bus stops. A good example, of course, for a specific improvement is, uh, is the commuter rail station that New Balance contributed to, uh, which is up and running and has been extremely well used. Uh, we're also working in South Boston, looking at it from a neighborhood perspective, particularly uh, connecting the good people who live in South Boston and who have jobs in the downtown area to take better public transportation. And finally, uh, we are working with transportation management associations or TMAs. These are made up of employers. These are nonprofits that are made up of employers, whether it's the Seaport TMA or the Better City TMA, uh, which is in downtown. Uh, and uh, we've done some surveys with them uh, to see what travel behavior might be in the, in the current months and in the post-pandemic world to get, a, to get a better understanding of what is it that we need to focus on to make it easier for our employees to come to work in Boston. So uh, sorry for taking up so much time, but I thought I'd give a quick summary of everything in one shot. Thank you very much. Um, I had neglected earlier to read a letter from our colleague, Councillor Campbell, that I want to make sure to get in the record. Dear Chairwoman Wu and colleagues on the committee, I regretfully cannot attend today's hearing on docket number 0424. I thank, I thank Councillor Lucia and, oh, sorry, everyone. Um, I thank Councillors Mejia and Wu for sponsoring this important conversation, especially in the midst of proposed cuts from the MBTA. While ridership may be down due to the pandemic, accessible public transit is still essential, especially to the thousands of essential and frontline workers who have no other option. I will be ably represented by a member of my staff at today's hearing and look forward to reviewing today's hearing recording and committee report and working with the committee on any recommended next steps. Sincerely, Andrea Campbell, Boston City Council District 4. Um, Councillor Flynn, you're next in line for questions. Thank, thank you, Councillor Wu. I enjoyed listening to Anna's comments about working with developers and when a development project goes up, what type of impact that has on pedestrian safety, what type of impact it has on public transportation. Those are the first questions I usually ask um, when a development team wants to develop in my district is how is it, how will it impact uh, pedestrian safety? So I wanna say thank you to Anna. Um, and then I had a good conversation last week with Stacy, and I just wanted to ask ask you, Stacy, um, with with potential cuts to the MBTA, what are other cities across the country doing um, in terms of public transportation? Are they doing similar cuts, or if they're not doing similar cuts, what other options are they thinking about that may address um, you know making sure we get our low wage workers and, and people in need into, into um, their jobs at night or home, home from employment. Um, so I just wanted to ask that question to you if you had any, any, yeah. any feedback, Stacey. Yeah, so um, a couple of things that I think are important for the council to note or be aware of. One, basically every transit system across the country is facing this right now. Um, and we are all sort of desperately hoping for federal stimulus. 
because it is a, a, a like a countrywide issue. About a, a thousand transit systems mm -hmm. are facing cuts or extinction. Um, and the federal house did pass a package that had stimulus for transit, but the Senate doesn't want to include it. There's a, a ton of background on that. So it is it is a crisis across the country. However, uh, Boston is unique, um, not exclusively, but unique in that um, the MBTA is uh, trying to make decisions much earlier than other transit systems across the country. So the MBTA is saying we're going to make this decision in early December because we need this runway and we're going to start we're going to start staving off these cuts or work doing some of this as early as January. Most other transit systems are trying to wait as long as humanly possible, holding out for their state legislatures and the federal government before they make those decisions. So that's been a key ask. Um, it, certainly, it's been an ask of the council, and it will continue to be an ask of of the advocates to just not make any decisions before the first of the year, um, because that is that is unique compared to other areas. Um, and then, in terms of you know other things that can be done. It's tough. I mean, you know, it's it's sort of like saying, well, if we get rid of the education system, how are how are we going to educate children? It's like, uh, by reinstituting the the thing that will keep people safe. I think, um, you know, I, I think this actually gets to your core issue. What we know is that when transit is cut, more people will drive and more people will walk and bike, and I think we'll see an uptick in um, in traffic, serious crashes, and fatalities in the city. So I think one area, um, you know, we have to be fighting to keep to keep this transit system moving, obviously, but I think it's an area that we need to watch out for. We've already seen an increase in, in uh, traffic fatalities, but we know from other, you know, sort of systems and other examples in the past that it, it can, our, our roadways will become more dangerous if we lose transit. And so I think it's an area to watch out for in an area where the, the city has a little more control. Thank you, Stacy. I don't have any further comments. I just wanna say thank you to um, the panelists to my colleagues, the sponsors. I wanna say thank you to Matt for being here and my friend Vineet, who I always enjoy working with, especially doing walking tours of my district. He's very knowledgeable and knows the city as well as anyone. Thank you, Vineet, for your dedication to the residents of Boston. Thank you, Councilor. I appreciate that. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Councilor Bach? Um, Ma Madam Chair, oh, I thought I was behind Councillor Braden, so I just want to. I don't, I don't see her on anymore. I th oh, no, I'm still here. Are you still here? Oh, I'm yeah. so sorry. Okay. So sorry. Oh, please go ahead, Councillor Braden. My apologies. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I, I want to echo um, Anna's um, frustration with the issue um, we're seeing a, a huge level of, of development out in Alston Brighton and many of, if they're, if they're businesses or, or biotech companies or whatever, they're building like five, 600, 800 parking spaces uh, so that people can commute in from the sub, I'm assuming they won't be commuting from around the corner, but they'll be commuting from, from the suburbs. Um, I really feel that we're missing an opportunity to leverage some more, uh, some more revenue or some more financial support for our public transit system uh, from developers. Um, the cost of a parking spot is anywhere from thirty-five to a hundred thousand dollars. So there's obviously saving uh, on the on the residential side. They're saving a lot of money by not building uh, parking, and then on the on the business side, they're spe they're expending a lot of money to. Um, to encourage people to use cars and and they're not thinking about people living locally in the neighborhoods and getting to those workplaces by transit or bicycle or or, uh, or walking so um i i really feel um that we're missing an opportunity to look at that as a, an, an alternative source of support for our mass transit public transit system i also have a little uh, on ease about the dependence of developers and residential communities uh, to go down the route of a private shuttle because it's basically a private limousine service to deliver people from luxury housing to their places of work and back and it doesn't have any impact or any uh, benefit to the local residents who uh, are essential workers who rely on the on the on the MBTA so I really feel that it's time 
it's really past time that we look at al alternative sources of revenue to support our mass transit system. And that would include developers and, and businesses. So it's more of a statement than a question, but um, that's my penny worth for now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Councillor Bach. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And thanks to all the panelists here today. Um, and I, yeah, I, I feel I feel sort of aware of this being a, a friendly panel in a very unfriendly situation, because um, I think we're all on the same page. Um, I, I know uh, the Chief of Streets was out with us in our protest against the cuts yesterday. I think that, um, you know, I think in Boston, we see on the ground what the impact is. And um, and, and, I, and I've been thinking a lot about the fact that uh, to Stacy's point about the timing and this kind of this this sense of artificial urgency, I think um, in a lot of ways, what disappoints me is it, it just has to do with what strikes me as a as a thinking mistake at the administration level that we saw precisely in the late night service thing, which is if an hour doesn't pay for itself, we should cancel it. Right. And it's this and it, it's besides the fact there's sort of two arguments. Right. One is like the people who need that hour really need it. Um, and that's true for our essential workers coming back from last shift. Yesterday, we were talking about how that's true for veterans getting in the VA. But there's that argument. And then there's also the argument that it's just like transparently obvious that you're going to trap yourself in a vicious cycle if you do that. Because as, as soon as as soon as you like decrease the uh, the capacity, then like, and especially in a moment where in theory, we're trying to increase capacity to have more space. It's just, to me, it's, um, it is intentionally uh, or at least inevitably, if not intentionally, inevitably leading us in the direction of a death spiral for the T. Um, and um, and it's so frustrating that not only not only is it wrong and does it hit all the wrong people, this thing, but it's just so short sighted. Like the 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 sort of like impact on our like our economy, our like ability to be in relationship, like the whole like the the sort of lived geography of our region, um, the, um, the, the sort of negative externalities just seem legion to me here. Um, and, and I think a lot about the fact that when we've got a bunch of people who have been pushed out of the city, live in Brockton now who come in and take the commuter rail into work. And, oh, if you don't, if you happen to work Saturdays and Sundays, you're going to be out of a, out of a job or else in a car. Right. And I just think about how we would never, I don't think in the state we would ever say, oh, you know, we're trying to, we're having budget challenges. So we're trying to decrease the frequency with which we resurface the highways. So we'd like to decrease utilization. So we're just going to close the pike in 93 on uh, weekends. Right. I mean, it's just like, it's, a, it's, it's just a joke. It's never going to happen. And I think, uh, I think we're coming up really strongly against the lived reality of like people actually being on the T and people who aren't. Um, and, uh, I'm just so frustrated. I realize that much like Councillor Braden, this is turning into more of a statement than a question. Um, but I, I, but I just want to say that I really, I really appreciate Vinit what your team is doing um, specifically around the transit orientation. And I saw it firsthand having the conversation with Matt about you know what our city agenda is along actually precisely that corridor on Huntington Ave as as the, he was doing some work there this summer. Um, and I think, you know, us looking at how to how to take those opportunities as a city um, whenever we can uh, in partnership with the T is great. Um, I think it's it's hard for us to find those moments of partnership if the T is is decreasing its own vision of, of what it's trying to achieve here. And and again, and I, I want to be clear, I, I don't fault the professionals at the MBTA who are deeply committed to transit, many of them for their li lifelong careers. Right. And are but we're at a larger level making a kind of prioritization decision um, that just is so unacceptable. And I, I guess I will, uh, Madam Chair, uh, just say that I, I, I personally think that it's far past time for us to have a kind of like regional taxing authority to support the MBTA that is, you know, based on the communities that use the T and know it and know its value. Because as much as I think we should be able to sell the rest of the Commonwealth on the fact that it's a critical economic engine and also a site of transit justice. I also just think that we all know its necessity so much that uh, we should be able, those of us who know that should be able to get together and raise revenue to support it um, in times like these. And it's frustrating not to not to be there right now. 
Um, but mainly just want to say um, certainly that to, you know, to Stacey and Anna and to Vinit's team, like, I think we're, we're all going to need to be strong allies against these service cuts this month and possibly in the months to come and, and definitely am on board for all, all fronts in that battle. So that, those are my comments, Madam Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Bach. I want to recognize that Councilor Flaherty has joined us and Councilor Sabi George said she had to hop off for one minute, but would be back, but I don't see her back yet. So unless someone has a response to Councilor Bach's comments. Um, okay, Stacey, I thought I, thought, I, thought I saw that. Um, yeah, no, one other thing that I think is helpful to flag. So I, I and I, I appreciate, you know, we, we know the council has our back. We know this is an area where we're like, we're all on the same page. Like we're all singing the same, uh, singing the same tune. Um, but one other thing that's unique in Boston is that Boston doesn't have a vote on the FMCB and that many of the other transit agencies that are choosing to delay having deeper conversation, it's because the most impacted municipalities have a vote. Um, and so I just think it's something else to sort of name around like, you know, we're going to be fighting in the short term, but in addition to regional ballot initiatives, in addition to long term balanced revenue, um, we need to be looking at the composition of who decides. <laughs> um, and, and I know that, you know, the administration has been pushing on this, but I think it's, I just wanted to flag it because it's another area where you know, for us to really fix this in the long term, we need to have a vote. <laughs> yeah, to, just to add to that, I think that the mayor has uh, been very public about uh, asking the state that Boston must have a seat on the FMCB board. It's, uh, we have uh, the maximum number of uh, T riders in our, our residents riding the T. And it's just uh, absolutely, and we pay, uh, as all of you know, uh, over $90 million in assessments. That's uh, more than some of our departmental capital budgets uh, every year, and yet we don't have a seat. Go for it, Anna. If I could jump in, I'm, I'm so sorry. I need to jump and um, go work on our food access assessment, which is also directly tied to transit. Um, but I just quickly want to raise up that the Alston Brighton CDC is hosting a couple trainings on how residents can be more engaged in the development process and really grounding a lot of the language and to Stacy's point, what, what people can ask for and what all of this technical terminology is. Um, so I really do encourage people to, to join in that. I know that Councillor Braden has, has been a part of that. Um, and, and please do, although I am focused in Alston Brighton, again, these issues are by no means Alston Brighton specific. So please do reach out with um, questions or support or ideas. I think we've had a lot of success in our neighborhood in spite of a lot of the challenges we face. So really, really happy to share um, some of our knowledge and, and um, the experiences we've had and, and any tips and tricks. So apologies for leaving, um, but please do reach out with any needs. And thank you again for, for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Councillor Flaherty, any questions or statement? Oh, thank you, Ma Madam Chair. Thank you for um, for uh, just a quick comment, actually. But thank you for uh, for uh, hosting and for uh, the co-sponsors as well. And I'm on record, obviously, a, a long time, uh, particularly as uh, former council president under the, the leadership of um, former councillor Michael Ross, uh, who led the effort to uh, get the uh, night owl service, is what we called it at the time. And so. Um, recognizing that Boston is a world-class city and it's a 24-hour city and particularly his district, which is now our colleague, Councilor Kinsey Box District, uh, the hospitals in particular with the, those third shift workers. Uh, you talk about the downtown and all of our hotels, et cetera. So uh, lots of activity happens uh, in Boston late at night. People need to get to and from uh, to work in order to, uh, to uh, access other services like our hospitals. So uh, I'm on record of supporting it, longtime supporter, and hopefully uh, it will be restored because uh, it's very necessary for our city, uh, particularly if we want to move forward uh, in a post-pandemic world. Uh, people need to have access to opportunities and uh, public transit uh, is the conduit to uh, providing that opportunity for folks to, to uh, participate. So thank you for again for hosting and for, uh, for cheering and uh, for sponsoring and happy to sign on to anything that comes from this. Thank you very much, Councillor Flaherty. Um, okay, so uh, would any other councillors like to have a second round of, of questions? Okay, um, I'll just note again, the 
the thanks and gratitude to our, our team at the city and, and the amount of time, the length of time that we've been working on this particular issue and sort of the, the scale and depth of, of the crisis happening at the T now, where demanding action on many, many fronts. Um, all that to say, it's incredibly frustrating that the T continues to refuse to show up at city council hearings. It's, it's this, it's recent ones about bikes on the blue line. It's years at this point of um, refusing to engage because they do not feel accountability. So, um, you know, that lies with the governor, that lies with the FMCB and, and um, the legislature in terms of the laws that will be reshaping the FMCB. Um, so we have a lot of work to do there and just to even get people to the table. Um, Councilor Mejia, sorry. Councilor Mejia or other councilors like to make a closing statement? Oh, um, I, <laughs> this is the times that we live in, Councilor Wu. It is so real. Um, but no, I just, I first just want to thank everyone for showing up to this hearing um, in the city, in the, in the administration. And I would like to echo Councilor Wu's uh, sentiments in regards to who isn't at the table. Um, I always look in the Zoom. You sh back in the day it was the room, but now we're in the Zoom and always see who is not here. And um, would also have to say that, um, you know, even bringing people who are living these realities into the space uh, is something else that I also want to just highlight. Um, and I think many of the folks that we are advocating on behalf of, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, are sleeping right now because they work the third shift. And so um, just because they're not here to speak on, on their own behalf doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have a voice. The reason why we're here is because we're advocating um, for, for them. And so just really wanna just acknowledge that and also just wanna thank my colleagues for their support. And you know, I believe that everything happens for a reason. The fact that we filed this back in, I don't know when it was February, March and we're having it and they, it was slated to be heard today um, at the heels of what uh, we're dealing with uh, speaks volumes to just kind of like how serendipitous it was um, and it, it gave us another opportunity to push. Um, but we have to get to the point where we have to stop just fighting um, and people need to roll up their sleeves and actually do the work um, because we're all willing participants and, we're, and ready. And I just think that on the state level, we need to um, push a little bit harder um, so that we can get to where we need to go. And I think accountability is key and it's gonna get to the point where we're gonna have to start doing that, you know, the public shame game here. Um, it's just really ridiculous that we are having this conversation um, when we can just make it so much easier for folks and just do the work, period. Um, so here for all of it and thank you, Councilor Wu for your continued advocacy in the space and looking forward to next steps. Thank you. Would any other colleagues like to weigh in before we close? Okay. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Oh, Vineet, would you like to say anything? Okay. All right. Thank you for your time. Uh, this will conclude our hearing on docket number 0424, order for a hearing discussing the status of late night MBTA service in Greater Boston. Uh, this hearing is adjourned and look forward to moving forward, <laughs> pushing the T in general. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.